Welcome back to another episode of Girls Know Nothing. For International Women's Day this year, UN's Women official theme is Digital. Digital aims to highlight the need for inclusive and transformative technology and digital education. With this theme in mind, I want to welcome our next guest, Seishi Akiwowo. Seishi is the CEO and founder of Glitch, and Glitch is an award-winning UK charity which is focused on ending online abuse and champion, championing digital citizenship. With a particular focus on black women and marginalized people, they focus on four key areas, awareness, advocacy, action, and anchor. I had the pleasure of meeting Seishi for the first time when Evil and Glitch combined forces to deliver a petition to Downing Street, asking for the government to implement a Violence Against Women and Girls Code of Practice into the controversial online safety bill. Before setting up Glitch, Seishi was elected as the youngest black female councillor in East London just at the age of 23. And that was when she experienced online abuse while in position that Seishi decided to set, set up Glitch to help support women and marginalised communities. She also co-designed practical solutions for governments, NGOs and tech companies to make the online sex space safer for all. In a true millennial style, Seishi is also a former TED speaker, a respected consultant and writer within the political and tech space. She is also a Penguin published author of How to Stay Safe Online, a digital self-care toolkit for de developing resilience and allyship. She also sits on the Guardianship Council of Yoti, TikTok Safety Council, and is a Gates Foundation Global Goalkeeper. In 2020, she was appointed a Knight Fellow of Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics at the George Washington University. Welcome to the studio, Shay. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Um, there are so many things I wanted to talk to you about. When I was reading your bio, I was like, how am I going to fit all of this into one episode? But one thing that um, really amazed me is that you were one of the, well, you were the youngest um, councillor elected in East London. You're only 23 years old. Um, you know, what What kind of inspired you to want to become a councillor in the first place? Yeah, um... Well, a mixture of things. I have a Nigerian mother who told me that I've got a couple of months left of enjoying this whole dance in malarkey and needs to go and find another passion. <laughs> and academics, or traditional academics, wasn't really my thing. And so that actually pushed me to explore, actually, what do I want to do? I know I want to um, use a platform and platform for good, but I didn't know what that was and I had to work that out. And then the kind of negative catalyst was a really good school friend of mine was stabbed at a house party and died. And she was my neighbor and she went, she was my primary school friend and my secondary school friend. And that really shook me. And I didn't understand why Charlotte was no longer with us. And so I was in year eight, year nine, asking a lot of questions about why, why, why. And it led me to youth services being cut. It led me to understanding poverty and socioeconomic um uh, socioeconomic differences in certain boroughs and kind of started this catalyst of anger and frustration at systems and pulling on that thread I realized okay I need to be a part of the decision making table to start turning around um the way people make decisions about my area and as I kept pulling on that thread even more I realized oh my god there isn't anyone that looks like me on this table and I was like 2021 20, at the time thinking okay I've done youth council stuff I you know I ran for young mayor I was on the youth council for Newham I don't want to be tokenized and pigeonholed on youth issues like I want to go to where like the real money is and the real decision making is and so I was like okay I'm gonna try and apply and so I think there's a little bit of naivety, which I think you do kind of need because if you do know the whole process of going for, for standing in, in party politics or for things, I think we can put ourselves off. And there's all sorts of stats that show that women need to be encouraged like three times to go for things, right? That they are actually actually um, competent um, for to apply for. So I think the naivety helped me and a glass of wine. I was like in Brussels on this internship for a European youth forum and... Um, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to go for it. And by the time I'd finished a bottle of wine in the, in the kitchen, I'd applied and I pressed send and I went for it. And 
It was truly one of the hardest but most rewarding experiences of my life. The people that I still bump into today who have told me as a, for the fact they came to my surgery and I advocated for them, X, Y, Z has happened. And I stood in an area in on the council where I actually grew up where Charlotte was, was um, and my neighbour. And so there was a lot of sweet memories to be able to put Maryland back on the map because it had been forgotten because it wasn't Stratford and... We, I just got elected just after kind of the Olympic legacy starts slowing down and actually saying, okay, what, what's the legacy of the Olympics for, for young people, for black people, for our, gener- our generation, where we were seeing lots of decisions being made about moving people on and gentrification. So it was really hard because ageism, sexism, racism, you name it, but the community that, that you get to serve in, in Newham, in East London, is unlike any other community and it will always be like a key milestone for me. I encourage people to give local politics a go. A lot of people think that politics is just parliament and democracy and so that's the only part to democracy and no, like politics and community starts local. That's actually why I went for it because I was in Europe uh, doing an internship, campaigning on vote at 16 across EU member states, voting on why do we have a youth minimum wage? Like, why are we not seen as an adult? And I was like, this is all really important, but like, how do I know it's landing on the ground? And there is something about being so connected to your community that is amazing. It has its downsides. People don't have boundaries. In- <laughs> <laughs> but overall, I, I encourage as many people to think about going for local politics because the average councillor is age 56, is white, male and stale. And people don't know that they can even go, they don't even have to be a councillor, right? You can be a lay member on certain committees that are scrutinising issues like the budget, like domestic violence services, like children's services. And you get remunerated for that as well. So it's not all volunteering. And that's why I also stood to be to be a counselor because I wanted to I wanted to shine a light to say young people can get into politics. Women particularly can get into politics. Do you think that maybe because you don't fit the stereotypical, um, well, what a stereotypical counsellor looks like, did mm. you find it really difficult to to kind of get your voice heard and to really get stuck in there? 100%. Again, the downside of naivety gets you through the door, but does it sustain you? And I think the naivety of, okay, how does party politics machinery really work? Like, how does small P politics really work? How do you win people over? Votes, it's a numbers game. Like, all of that, like, oh my God. Uh, um, it was really hard and being dismissed as a kind of like activist young person or you know the kind of like misogynistic language like shrill or shriek you know just those little things that can chip at you or chip at you from people that you think are meant to be on your side and I do think the left in this country has a gender problem it hasn't gotten to grips with how it needs to bring women into the fold if you look at a lot of our left-wing movements it's still dominated by men um, and we don't have enough women in powerful positions in officer positions of unions and stuff like that like we still need to have a lot more women a lot more working class women a lot more black women so that was quite hard um, but my tip there and something that I did towards the end of my term was making sure that I, I was in sisterhood so I was leading a lot of young women in the party to draw sorry, to join, um, doing training and events, like teas and coffees at our MP's house. And I think making sure when you go into politics, you don't go as an individual, you go in a squad. And that's why, where I, why I love AOC and the like, um, the amazing uh, uh, politicians in America who are like supporting each other as a block and not on your own. Why do you think it's so important that we encourage young people, uh, young women, especially um, young women from ethnic minority backgrounds into politics, despite the hardships they can face? I get it. Like, if you're a young black person right now who is battling £300 energy bills, is battling a landlord trying to raise your rent, and you're hearing what now she's saying she needs to go and stand now this person's randomly on a podcast telling me I need to stand for politics like with what time I totally hear it um uh but if we really want to change the system we have to be in there we we have to understand how much local council decide things and there's loads of jokes I think you know when you see tv shows like parks and recreation that make you think that local council is just about bins and parking which Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> it's a very sensitive issue. But like I said before, they're deciding youth services. They're deciding the provision of, 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 of um, 
how children are looked after, looked after children, children, children who are are in care, like the councils, the corporate parent for the for these young people. Um, deciding around planning, which people don't understand how important it is. If the council keeps allowing chicken and chip shops, chicken and chip shops in their schools, then we are going to have a problem with diabetes. We are going to have a problem with obesity. We are going to have a problem, which we do right now, is kids losing their teeth because it's rotting. Like we have a real dental crisis happening, and the council decide this. The council decide park how parks are t- um, parks are kept clean, how parks park equipment are used, encourage people to use the outdoor. And we saw how important that was during the lockdown. And so I think if we can shine a light on the issues that are important in local council, I think people, especially, especially young women, can see, actually, this is where I can spend my time. And it's not about being on it for everything. Yeah, you might not be interested in parking or whatever. My 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 real driver and issue was domestic violence and young people. And that's what I focused on. And so if you are a busy young person, you've got a lot on and you're thinking like, how can I do this? It is doable and you just need to be strategic and focus. What was your biggest highlight of your career, do you think? Well, as a, your time as a counsellor? Oh my God, I have so many, but the one that makes me smile, which seems so small, but it allows me to talk about the importance of local council is getting a Christmas tree up in Maryland. So Stratford, outside Stratford Station, Westfield, was a massive, big, massive tree. Everyone knows it. Everyone comes out for it. Maryland, that is down the road, has a massive population, majority um, uh, Afro-Caribbean community as well, but then has, there has been gentrification sp- spillover from, from Stratford. It's often forgotten. And you can see, you can see in terms of where the roads, the road from Maryland kind of starts and, and it's not clean, it's dirty, it smells, cl- shops are like, are, are struggling and so being able to do to get a Christmas tree was a symbol of this is a place, this is a community, and we get to know each other. And because of that, businesses were thriving. Because of that, people were connecting. And now the group still stands. Now the group actually has formed a ward. So it has council representation. It's not being shoehorned into Stratford. So people look at a Christmas tree and think, is that it? And to be fair, many other areas of Newham have now got a Christmas tree. And I think I started a trend. Um, people think just a Christmas tree, but no, actually what I've what I kickstarted and helped facilitate was a community again and thrive and shine a light. And those guys have taken it to a whole nother level and it's amazing to see. Yeah, I guess there is like there really isn't anything without community and it kind of it's the it's the part of politics that you get to physically touch every single day. Like the moment you leave your front door, it's what you see. And like, you know, when I was younger, I used to be like, oh, Christmas tree, another Christmas tree or another set of Christmas lights, but the amount of work that goes behind it, there's obviously a reason I've always people wouldn't put that much time and effort into it. And it's really nice to hear that, you know, you often hear bad and negative news stories about certain areas of London as opposed to like the good things. And it's, so it's really nice to hear that there are some good things um, that have come out of your career. What do you think was probably like the hardest part of being such a young counsellor? Um, I've got two. It was my, we had just got elected in, I just got elected on the Thursday announced on the Friday and then I had a surgery on Saturday so counsellors have community surgeries um, in their library in the community centre where residents of that ward um, can come and talk to their counsellor for issues around housing around um, oh god anything anything to do with local council services um it was my first surgery on my own. I'd shadowed the kind of previous counsellor before just to get, you know, get a, get a heads up and, you know, be I was a bit of a goody-goody. And um, this woman came to me and she basically was like, help me. My my friend has to evict me because my her, his place is infested with cockroaches and I don't have anywhere to live. She's heavily pregnant. She has a young kid who I think was displaying some symptoms of 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 the impact of being in a... In a in a home environment that was too small and too 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 crowded, um, and then there was another um, young lad outside, and apparently it was another kid, and I was and I was just looking at this young woman by herself, just like my heart ached, my heart was heavy. I could not not think about my mum who was here and as a single mother, and I was thinking, what can I do to support without you know sharing her story or whatever. As she's getting some documents to show me, a cockroach comes out of the oh, the wow. baby bag. And I remember the the one thing in training was, don't cry. There's no point yeah. to if you crying. You've got to hold it down. But Sharon, like, even today, I still get emotional about that story because I don't think people should have to suffer like that no. in this world with, 
and be so alone. And I even said, where's the dad? Like I got, I got so, I got so emotionally invested. And I remember when she had left, thankfully she was my only one. I sobbed my heart out. I cried all weekend. I said to my mom, I don't think I can do it. But then I saw her four years later. She spotted me in Stratford Shopping Centre. <laughs> and she said, do you remember me? Do you remember me? And I looked at her and I was like, I do. And she showed me that her state, she showed, she showed, I don't want to get into her business, but um, four years of like her persevering and that we got, we got there, but that was really hard. And then the second thing that was really hard, and I think that was when I was like, I just don't think I can do this anymore, was when um, a young boy called Corey was shot, was shot in the head in uh, an estate uh, two days before he was going to go to college and get out of the area and, you know, try and start again. And I remember just hearing his mum scream and cry in the interviews and trying to... And no one was coming forward and it just it just felt like there was this family hurting and they were completely isolated and, like, just where was the community... And I also didn't appreciate the kind of gentrified community saying, oh, what's going on here, blah, 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 as well. So there was also that to deal with. Like, yeah. actually, do you know that you're part of their community? You are the, you aren't the native here. And that, so that was really hard to deal with on a different level. And I thought to myself, okay, I've been this since I was 22. I'm 26. There are other ways to make a difference and a change that doesn't take from me so much and also where I'm having to convince party folks to uh, to adopt policy issues and to care about this because we had a mayor at the time that was happy to just send people out of the borough mm. convince a party a party to care about this as a kind of national policy issue it just felt too hard so now I want to be on the outside knocking and making more noise than trying to like do collective responsibility and feel like I'm I was silenced Sometimes it's hard because you have to deal with all, like you said, the party lines and having to deal with all the additional red tape. But with that um, young woman you were talking about, it goes to show like how much of an impact you had on her life, even though it was horrible and negative mm-hmm. at the time. The fact she even remembered you four years on really says a lot for what you did. So, you know, like, even if it was really hard, like I commend people like you that actually put themselves forward because it's not easy at all. No, it's not easy. And I do think like it doesn't have to be this hard. Like I do think there is a lot of people suffering in, and even more so now with austerity cuts and stuff. I don't think it needs to be hard if we supported counsellors. Like I don't think we support counsellors with the lack of boundaries some residents have with yeah. with 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 counsellors and MPs um, and online. We don't support counsellors online and we know that actually they receive the most intimidation and abuse because everything is so local. Like, you know, you've got counsellors who would go to do the school run and will get hounded on the way to the school run with their kids. Like, it, like it's, it's a lot. And then we don't support them psychologically. Like, I'm also aware that I come from a borough where our MP was stabbed at his surgery. Yeah. And... Um, that wasn't taken really seriously for counsellors and there was right, there was an increase in kind of um uh kind of like racial tensions on top of Joe Cox MP being murdered and that wasn't taken seriously, like our fear. So I do think a lot systemically could be done to support young women. But when you say obviously the sexism and the sexist will say, Oh, your snowflakes are not tough enough, and that needs to be challenged. Yeah, no, I agree definitely. And it's, you know, we we do see online and uh, you know young women in politics or women in general in politics that say that they are disproportionately targeted because they want to be taken out of politics because they speak about issues like you do and I guess like that's the re- like what I read the, as the reason why you started Glitch in the first place um what was kind of the reason why you wanted to form Glitch I it, I talk about this in the book about being trauma informed and trauma led, and there was a lot of there was a lot of tr- trauma around the catalyst for setting it up. Um, so, but, but but one was that I felt somewhat complicit in spending four years encouraging young women to stand for politics, and then when we get here, we're going to be abused, and no one's going to support us. So I kind of felt like if I've like opened the floodgates in a way to like have to inspire more people to join. Now my thing is to take on the hat of supporting those that are staying. That that's We don't actually just need people to get into politics, we need them to stay. And we saw that with the last elections, how many women cited online abuse and violence as a reason for why they were standing down from um, uh, parliament and local politics. And so I, I wanted Glitch to 
I, I wanted Glitch to serve a purpose for women in public life, whether it's campaigners, activists, to feel that they can be online and that can, they can be safe. And also for anyone who's online to realize like we don't have to tolerate the the direction that tech companies were going around, like work fast, break things, apologize later. And that break things were all, was always impacting women. And I was also quite annoyed that intersectionality was being missed. It felt like we kept focusing here in the West on white women's experience of online abuse and harassment. That was the stuff that was going mainstream and not actually black women who we know are 84% more likely to be abused online. So there was a kind of a lot of like frustrations on multiple levels, plus the trauma that was like, there's a glitch in our internet that can so be fixed. Like I can see it as light a day if we just all play our part, which birthed the idea of digital citizenship. Like how do we understand that we have rights and responsibilities online? We have a right to go to school and we have responsibilities to be respectful for teachers. And I put my hands up that I could have been a bit more respectful to my teachers. But with all rights comes responsibilities. And we actually haven't had that kind of reset culture conversation around how do we want to navigate with each other online? How do we want to make sure that We are not perpetuating the same inequalities, the same divisions offline, now online. We've made such strides in feminism to not lean into victim blaming language, right? To not blame somebody for being spiked in a club or being harassed on the streets or being assaulted. We've we've made strides. It can be better, obviously. And I talk about this in the book. But we've made strides. But online, we kept blaming women. What did you say to get that trolling? What did you say to get whatever? Why did you take a photo of yourself and allow yourself to get hacked? Like, we found a way to keep blaming women. And it was all a distraction from women being in, 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 in democracy, but that is sharing their opinion, writing a blog piece, standing for politics and that was why I was like we need to set something up we need to set this something up that is about system change I don't want to go down the we need to criminalize every offense I don't want to go down we just need to keep telling women how to stay safe online I want to look at systemic change and I think for that we need to be looking at legislation we need to be looking at tech influencing and we need to be empowering our community to be able to create and demand the safe spaces that they want online so what what so if somebody was to go through down the, the d- digital citizenship um, path, what actually happens? What does it entail? And what, what can somebody gain out of it? I define digital citizenship in three layers, the individual, the social, and the institutions. I think on an individual layer, layer it's or on an individual level, it's about being aware of how we navigate online. So thinking about our online etiquette, thinking about what we're amplifying, what we're retweeting, what's happening in the name of banter, like making sure we are not perpetuating or perpetuating hate, we're not spreading abuse and we're not spreading misinformation. Like there's so much that's in our control. How we curate the the algorithms and our timelines, like how we feed the algorithms as well, like making sure that we are just good and aware and informed. I think the second thing is on second layer is on a social level. Like, how are we supporting each other as allies online? How are we supporting each other as, as understanding we're in a community? Because tech platforms use a lot of community language, you know, but yet don't do anything to facilitate actually feeling like a community and this kind of collective responsibility to each other. And what does collective self care look like? So it's exploring, okay, when I see abuse, it's my opportunity to report it, to support that person. Just as if you were to go down the street and you see like some mess outside your door, you would want to put it in the bin because, you know, you'd want your area to be somewhat safe or you saw someone being harassed on the tube, for example, on the train, you would intervene. Like how do you evoke those same emotions in people to be like, actually, this is my community too. And this is the I'm not going to tolerate this online. And on the institutional level, it's about how do institutions support and encourage digital citizenship? How do they encourage, you know, screen time, good, good, good use of screen time? How do they encourage good digital self-care? How do they encourage um, not just mining our data, our information and our time, but actually being responsible? How do they, how do they, uh, how are they transparent about their data? How are they transparent about taking down content and what they're amplifying? Like, institutions have a part to play in in promoting good digital citizenship. And finally, governments, like, I envision seeing libraries, and I hope they stay. (laughs) I envision seeing libraries having, you know, a QR code that allows parents and kids to be able to learn about digital citizenship. Like, let's make it everyday, like, um, conversation. Because we saw 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that domestic abuse was such a taboo. 
and being able to encourage conversations, encourage kind of tea conversations amongst, you know, amongst women, but also spotlighting it in in soaps like EastEnders and Coronation Street and talking about it in school. Like we saw there was a public health approach by government to spotlight this and educate masses. We don't have that when it comes to online abuse. So a lot of people are suffering in silence. A lot of people don't know where they can go. Institutions are also not supporting therapists and health, health service providers with symptoms of online abuse or the impact, the psychological impact of online abuse. And I talk a lot about that in the book around, actually, I think the NHS aren't equipped with dealing with the raft of people who are not just reporting to have ADHD and other mental health um, challenges because of, online, because of being online and that sustained and prolonged engagement online, but also the trauma of violence and abuse that what it does to your body, NHS are not equipped to properly diagnose PTSD. And then we get into the race and gender element where women are seen as, as uh, snowflakes and black women are not seen and their pain and their, and their trauma is not believed. And all of that can really be, I, I believe, are such low hanging fruit that could mean that we're reversing the trajectory of like online abuse just increasing and getting worse and causing more division in our online and offline communities. No, I agree. And I think, you know, one thing that we always talk about is physical self-care, like running a bath. Like, yeah. what can we do to physically look after ourselves? And we forget now that the internet is such a big part of our lives. Like, I don't remember the last time I went a whole day with no access. Mm. And it must have been like, well, years ago for me. And But we never talk about digital self-care. What do, what can people do to take better care of themselves while being online? I I really think digital self care starts with knowing you, and so when I get asked that, um, and I try and I go into a lot of detail in the in the book, particularly chapter five on digital self care, I, it really starts with like. Who are you? Who are you? What's your values? How do you want to show up in the world? If if someone was to create, probably an AI tool can do that now, <laughs> to create a persona based on your online presence, would that reflect who you really are and your values? Or has the screen caused you to pretend to be some kind of something else? The, um, is, it, is, it, is it a worse version of yourself as well? So I really say like digital self-care is about going back to you and creating boundaries so that you can flourish and be your best self. And so that might mean for one person that they do need to have a digital detox once a week to just recalibrate and regulate their nervous system because it is easy, because it's a tension culture, right, to get caught up in that. And as you get caught up, that reactivity um, uh, space gets uh, shorter and shorter and then you snap and you react, maybe not in the way you would because you haven't been able to respond and do it from a place of mindfulness. So I really do think digital self-care starts with like knowing you. What are you about? Who are you for? Who do you want to, who do you want to follow? Who don't you want to follow? And put it in place and not giving a damn if you have to restrict people's uh, access to you or restrict viewing them because you think it's a bit awkward that you don't want to, it to be obvious that you don't follow them. Just do it because you would not not do that offline. You wouldn't, you wouldn't stay near a fire knowing it was burning you. <laughs> yeah. Yet we do that to ourselves psychologically. Um, and I think digital self-care is not being hard on yourself when you get caught up in the trance of attention culture and trends and all of that, because that's what the platform does. It's just knowing you can come back to a set of values and set of intentions of why you're online. In our workshops at Glitch, um, the first the first place I, st I start with is asking people, why are you online? Is it for your business? Is it for your political career? And then I say, do you think that what you're posting reflects that? And a lot of people will realize, oh, crap, actually, I've blurred the personal and the professional. And I'm like, you don't have to, you have choice, you have agency. And I think that's deep because a lot of women have been told they don't have agency. We've been told that we have to, so we have been socialized and told that we have to serve men, serve others and put our needs, not even second, last, you know? Yeah. Digital self-care is about turning that around and saying, actually, I place myself and my needs first so that I can love myself and love you at the same time and be in community with you online and offline. It's, it's really interesting you hearing you say that because I remember years ago when I was a kid, we'd always get told like, if the words you said were printed on your skin, would you say them? And it's the same thing about if the, if the comments you left on people's platforms or on your own platform was printed on your skin, would you still press post? And 95% of the time, people wouldn't. 
And the thing is as well with technology and social media, they've got very good algorithm. Well, it depends on which side you sit on. The mm. algorithm is very good. It's very smart. And it goes in a vicious circle. But if you do take that time to have the digital detox and cut it off, the algorithm will also work in your favor because then you'll start to see content that actually does align with yourself. So then it does have a, a continuous circle of positive re- effects on you. Massively. Now my Instagram is full of sausage dogs. I want a sausage dog. Nail design. <laughs> Do you mine? Oh, yeah. You have a sausage dog. Oh my God, it's see photos. <laughs> A sausage dog, nail art designed to inspire me for my regular nail appointment. Um, way the, the way the crafted gadgets that people buy to like smart their house, I love that, and that brings me so much joy. Whereas when I know I'm on Twitter, I'm really like, okay, what am I going to see next? Like, what's the trending topics? What's going to agitate me? And you know, the last few weeks has not been easy being a black woman online. You've no. seen what's happened with Sister Space and the yeah. abuse that they've received. You've seen what's happened with Dr. Shona and the abuse that she has received, and that's horrific. And then you've seen a trending video go viral of a young schoolgirl being beaten up outside. Yeah. Like, it's not been nice to be on Twitter recently as a black woman. And um, despite being able to mute and block and know all of these things, sometimes I do need to disengage because what's going to happen? You're going to keep pushing my buttons and I'm going to get irate. Then I'm going to sit there on Thursday with my drink and I'm going to be, tr- I'm going to be thinking that I'm arguing with people that I can, I can reason with. That's yeah. not a good use of my time, their time and the people that follow me. No, I agree, definitely. And I think, like, I've done this to myself as part of my own digital detox is that I've turned off Twitter for notifications. Great. I've put settings in place that only certain people can DM me, only certain people can tweet me, like all of these things. And I feel so much better for it. Like, I only go on Twitter now when I feel mentally ready to do it. And... I I know it sounds ridiculous to a lot of people, but it does have a huge impact on like your everyday life. 100%. I mean, this is going to sound like like I'm a conspiracy theorist, but you know, (laughs) if people Google this, it's true. But there are, there is known kind of like, there is a known tactic by the big tech giants to put lawyers and medical professionals on retainers, make them sign an NDA. And so we don't know what's actually going on. We know from Francis uh, Haugen, who did the, who was a whistleblower last year, and um, and and uh, you know spoken spoken at many parliaments and and congresses around the world. Um, we know from her testimony, like the dangers and impact because she had to whistleblow. So tech companies are sitting on this data that shows the attention span, that shows what it does to young people's minds, um, and it's 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 in it's it's maddening to me that we think that. Once somebody turns 18, the effects that you've shown it has on children just stops applying to adults. And I've been intentional about that. Like, kid, like we did use Glitch, did used to go into schools, and then the pandemic made that even hard. But now we actually saw as an opportunity to say that actually there is a lot of education materials out there for young people to be safe online. It could be more gendered for women, 100%, and yeah. we play an advisory role on that. But in terms of our users, I actually felt quite confident post-lockdown to keep focusing on 18-year-olds, to keep focusing on 18 plus olds because they just get abandoned after they turn 18. Yeah. They're in university and they're meant to be this adult and then people are taking inappropriate photos of them online. You're hearing loads and loads of like sexual harassment happening online and, and, and offline. And I'm like, who's supporting these young people? That's my who I care about and, and upwards. I think arguably turning 18 or officially becoming an adult is probably the scariest time in your life. (laughs) Yeah. Like, and even now thinking about it, like I'm getting closer to 30 and I still think that being a turning 18 was the scariest time of my life. Like I'm all of a sudden legal to do all these things, but who is actually there to support me and guide me? And I think that's really important that you said that you focus on 18 because you're more likely to become a parent in your adult years than you are as a child. So, you know, that you pass on your knowledge to a child as well. Like my mum... Is, is from Asia and she had this weird conspiracy theory that if she turned a computer on it would burn her finger oh. so like you know she didn't teach you anything about computers so you know luckily for me I found these resources and I was very self-sufficient mm. but you know if I wasn't mm. I could become in a very weird place and my mum wouldn't know what to do mm-hmm. so technically you are kind of helping people get educated for parenthood as well as their own adult life. And I really, really hope so because we millennials are the last generation that got to benefit from analogue. You know, that yeah. had a cassette player, <laughs> that had to go to Woolworths on a Saturday to get... Yeah, like we're <laughs> the last ones that have been able to have some understanding of 
balance, yeah. right? Because we were forced to, because like to go online <laughs> when I was younger, I had to go on dial up. I had to wait. Oh my God, I remember that. <laughs> I had to wait. <laughs> and so we are the ones that now can really stewardship, you know, the Gen Zs and uh, and the next generation. And I do think Gen Zs are a lot more savvy than we give them credit for. Um but the rise of incel movements, the rise po- post during uh, Andrew Tate and others, um, that's what I worry about. They're, they're, they're per- the perpetrators of Gen Z's generation. I don't think we are quite skilled yet to understand like how organized that stuff is. Uh, and I kind of dread to think how organized it is. And I, I think it's something that I don't even think I'm ready to, to get into. I have seen that Glitch do have some very amazing collaborations. And when I read it, I was like, oh my God, like I would love to do this. Or like, how did... So, you know, I saw on your website that you collaborate with BT Sport on um, your, their Draw the Line. How did that collaboration kind of come about? Well, we're going back now to 2021 when... We predicted through our ripple effect report that online abuse is going to increase because more people are at home and, you know, they're bored. Yeah. And we saw that with the matches because there was nothing left to, to watch but <laughs> football games upon football games. And um, we could see that actually online abuse in sports was increasing. And as players were becoming more diverse, clubs were not being equipped with how to deal with it. So we always had it as like an, atten- uh, as a, an intention slash moon board. I'm really into manifest- manifesting and um, moon boards. We had it as like, this is a, a, a kind of ideal um, audience we'd love to work with and also has a massive domino effect. Like if you can influence, you know, big football clubs and umbrella organizations in sports, like it will filter through. So it wasn't just like BC Sport we were working with. We had uh, we had relationships with in cricket and I was learning so much about the abuse women in cricket were getting. I was like, oh my God, cricket. Like, obviously, you know, as, as a feminist, like obviously it's everywhere. It doesn't just stop at cricket, but yeah. it's, it's like crap. Like there's not one safe space for women. Yeah. Um, we were talking to people in netball. Obviously there was the post Me Too as well. A lot of organizations were trying to do things to get more women into sports. So a lot of the um, young women's groups in sports were getting in touch. And then BT Sport was like, look, we, we have to do something about this. And like, can you help us? And so we said, yeah, but we have to help shape the campaign. We have to help shape the the research and the data. And they were really up for that. They wanted to be evidence and research led. So we'd made sure that it was intersectional, that it was about focusing on race and gender in that, and that we had stats that showed not just how bad online abuse is, because we know that, but actually how many people witnessed it and didn't know what to do and how do we equip and empower them. So we made it an empowering conversation. And that led to me doing a TV ad on BT Sport. It was funny because I always get my boyfriend's friends be like, look, it's Shay and, <laughs> and sending a photo. Um, talking about how to spot, support, report, just keeping it really simple of like, it, when you want to get involved in addressing online abuse, it doesn't have to be this big, like, leap step. It can just be like, okay, I've seen this behavior online isn't okay. We need to do something about it. I'm going to report it and I'm going to support the person. Like, let's just get that into our everyday habit, like brushing our teeth. And it's been a, it's been amazing working with BC Sport. They have such influence in in uh, the tech space as a as a tech company as well as the football space. And um, it's now evolved into this uh, draw the line campaign. Is now involved into this kind of Hope United, which was uniting all the football clubs. And we've got this campaign now for the House of Lords to amend the online safety bill to include women and girls. So it feels like a really nice narrative. And the one thing I'll say about BC Sport is that they were willing to do the work internally, as well as preach the tech companies what they had to do. So we worked with their policy team and their social media team to make sure that their HR policies and their internal policies were allowing them to support their staff and support their talent and support players and support people who do like the media pundit before saying, okay, Twitter, what are you going to do? And that was also really powerful. I think it's really nice to hear like a big corporation that's actually taking it very seriously because quite a lot of the time you see big corporations use it as a PR stunt. Yeah. And it will be like this big poster and then okay, budgets run out or like, you know, we're done now, we're moving on to the next thing. So to hear like of an, an actually a big corporation that is you know, I'm a BT customer. <laughs> like, they, they, there's so many people that have BT at some point in their lives. So to hear that, like, 
such a big company does take it so seriously is is amazing. And, you know, during the, um, I think it was 2021 Mm. Euros, we saw that black players were disproportionately Mm. targeted for missed penalties Mm. or whatever you want to justify it as. There is no justification because, Mm. you know, you couldn't run for 90 minutes at alone perform in that way in front of that many people and you know I'm so grateful that women the women's game is becoming more prevalent and more talked about but I was just I was really concerned and I don't think it's probably come to many people's forefront in their mind that if you know the male players were receiving this kind of abuse and they I arguably have more budget or more protection of some kind then what's it gonna what's gonna happen to you know ethnic minority female players because we know as well that when you're a woman it's quite sexually aggressive trolling as well and there is no escaping that so what like how do how are bt going to go forward and support that or how is glitch going to go forward and support the the women's game so yeah um i can't speak for bt but but for us at glitch what we are interested well we have done we're aware of the research around how players are getting abused and stuff. And I think that's really important. And we are aware of how it, that impacts... Um, I'm, I'm learning loads. I'm learning loads about sports. Um, <laughs> I'm also how that impacts certain certain clubs as well and leagues. Yeah. leagues. And I think that's, that's really important because as you talked about the resourcing, so certain top six football women's clubs get... Um, Get the, get the support now because it's kind of trendy and sexy, but what about the lower leagues? So that's all really interesting. And then for us now, we're trying to map um, how do we empower the players to be able to not just call out the abuse on their platform, but, but, di- but, di- but use that as an opportunity to direct their followers and their supporters um, to services like Glitch and others and the campaign like so that it doesn't fall on our, us every time there's a game that we have to what are we going to do what are we going to do which is amazing it's powerful community it's powerful sisterhood but, like tech companies can do something about it so if we can use that to galvanise and say look why are women and girls not on the online safety bill what are tech companies doing to track and systemically address and mitigate gendered harms on their platforms that will be the win for me um, because sadly there will be another event. There'll be another thing. There'll be the Olympics. There'll be Love Island. There'll be Strictly Come Dancing. There'll be something else that will be like, okay, what are we going to do about it? It's not we now, actually. It's them. It's the institutions. Yeah. Is there a thing with Strictly? Yeah. So um, on Strictly, there is, um, it's, been, it's been speculated that there is going to be a disabled um contestant who will be in a wheelchair and there was abuse from that there was abuse as you said with uh, same sex couples and as 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 inspiring as it was to have last year's winner who was deaf do that powerful piece there was abuse there as well so we don't see it because we're in a very nice values aligned uh echo chamber but there are millions out there who are um witnessing and seeing this kind of trolling and it is impacting um disabled communities who when I go when I'm fortunate to go to panels or workshops I don't get to do that as much anymore um uh glitches workshops and I when I hear how this how online abuse impacts the disabled community like people specifically sending flashing gifts so it would spark an epileptic attack or sending audio knowing that they can't hear it like but it's obviously like aggressive and rude. Like it's disgusting. Yeah, because we obviously were like moving on to the, like the online safety bill. I did get to meet you the first time when we delivered. Thanks so much for coming um, along. No, I honestly, I really appreciated the invite when we delivered the petition to Downing Street. And unfortunately, we did lose the legal but harmful mm. aspect of the bill, which potentially could have covered. Yeah, all of that. That stuff. Um, and I. I never thought, like, I'm very, uh, I'm an able body person, so I don't have, I can't firsthand experience these things. But when somebody mentioned to me that it was a thing, mm. it made me feel violently ill that yeah. somebody could be so malicious yeah. or nasty to want to do that to somebody yeah. and cause that kind of pain. Yeah. Um, why do you think the online safety bill is super important? Because it's going to be the first kind of regulation that the UK have had of social media platforms and other countries around the world will be looking at us and this will set a precedent. So if we don't get this right, like other countries will, it will get, it will be worse, it will be worse. the implementation could be worse and particularly countries that have a, have a, 
less progressive stance on freedom of expression and, you know, live in a kind of autocratic or dictatorship um, state. I mean, I'm from Nigeria and we've just had the results of the Nigerian election, which I'll put to one side, but Nigeria is known for proposing and passing controversial bills around social media and the uses of it. And, and when it was used by activists to hold platform, um, uh, government to account. So it's, it's, it's important in, in the precedent it was set. And also, I just don't think you can claim this to be the online safety bill and it's not actually keeping people safe. I yeah. think it's actually setting people up to for, for false expectations, to be honest. I think what we have at the moment is an online safety bill for children. Yeah. And that's fantastic. Let's just call it that. You know, like then you're not wasting our time. But if you're calling it online safety bill that is meant to make the UK the safest place to be online, it, it's not doing that no, because you've not. skipped out 50% of the population. You've 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 still in 2023 failed to understand intersectionality and how multiple Intersex and identities mean that a lot of people in this country are uh, at, at a disadvantage when it comes to being online. And we've lost also the important element around education. And I, and I fear that this online safety bill is just going to be amended to become more about criminalizing. Criminalizing platforms, which I think is an interesting take around accountability, criminalizing actual individuals in tech companies. But also you, it's moving to criminalizing cyber flashing, criminalizing this and this and that. And we know that actually sending people to prison doesn't reform it doesn't actually reform character. And actually, there is evidence around uh, transformational justice and you know community justice and other ways. Like, don't get me wrong, there are some. Can I swear? Oh yeah, <laughs> there are some dickheads that do need <laughs> to be locked away and away from society and harm. But that this 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 narrative that to to address online safety is to be tough on on perpetrators is the wrong way around. Where's the support for victims? Where's the support for survivors? Like I said earlier, where's the support um, for the regulator to, to make sure that um, survivors and victims can put forward cases? That has been weakened in the bill as well. So we actually don't have a mouthpiece. We don't have a representative. And it's a shame because there is such opportunity for this to be a bill that allows Ofcom, the proposed regulator, to be somewhat like the e-safety commissioner in, in Australia. Um, it's a, the e-safety commissioner is, a, is a, you know, a, a, an appointed person, so you've got a kind of accountable face who you can go to to share your issues and complaints and, um, around the platform when you've reported something and we all know where they say, we found no evidence of this oh, breaking terms. Yeah. This, <laughs> this East State Commission in Australia has to deal with that. We're not sure what Ofcom will do here. So again, is it the privileged few that who can get the time of ministers and the time of Ofcom and regulators that will have their cases heard? When we know that people who are disadvantaged are super busy and don't have the cultural capital to engage. So there is so much about um, the online safety board that it needs to, be, needs to be better. But the one thing, the one thing that can really rectify this is a code of practice that means that tech companies have to systemically address online abuse that disproportionately impacts women and girls and looks at it from a preventative and also how it's mitigated it. If we can get that amendment, which has got cross-party support, and thank you again, Sharon, for coming in a very cold January to hand in the petition, which now has over 100,000 people supporting it. If we can get that amendment in, it will chip away at seeing that online abuse is neutral, which we know it's not. It will chip away at tech companies having to report on the data and we can use that for online safety build 2.0. It's um, really interesting. Like we are, even though the UK is a very small nation as a whole, mm -hmm. we are looked at in the international media as trailblazers. And this is one of those examples where we have the opportunity to be a trailblazer and to set the precedent for the rest of the world for what we can do for, you know, we said it's a lot that's protecting children, but mm. also protect women and mm. girls online. You know, this government have made a commitment yeah. or they claim to have made a commitment to be the government that goes further in protecting women and girls mm. but I just don't see it because they're so reluctant to include this code of practice and you know off camera I was saying to you that I was when I posted a reel about us yeah. handing in the petition I had a couple of battles with trolls that were like oh well you know women are very protected in society and when I broke it down to them and said yes we've called it the you know Vogue code of practice but in reality it does protect men as well and if you actually took the time that you were using to troll me to read what we were actually asking for where do you think 
like, tell me where you think what we're asking for is wrong or too much. And they went away and read it and they came back and said, actually, yeah, I understand where you're coming from and I've signed the petition. Fantastic. So I was like, you know, if you took five minutes Mm. to actually understand what the code of practice is for and what we're asking for, it's not to shut men out or say that they're not Mm -mm. worth protecting. It's just that women are disproportionately impacted by cyber flashing, for example. Like, you know, I've said it countless times, I get three penis pictures a day. I don't want to see them. I really don't. It's disgusting. But I get sent them. And I think it's because people use it as a way to deter the fact that I'm a very outspoken feminist. But it doesn't matter the reason as to why they're sending it to me. It does cause a high level of distress and it does transpire into real life. You know, if somebody walked past me down the street and sent me, like showed me their penis, they'd get arrested. That's the one thing that that's good about the cyber flashing kind of amendment, which is taking away the intentionality. Yeah. It's where the Communications Act that we have before, um, currently, well, we have before the Online Sister Bill currently, um, fails. You have to prove that the person that was sending you a dick pic was trying to cause you harm. I mean, what else are they trying to do? <laughs> but also, why are you trying to make me be the one that now has to be, you know, Olivia Pope or Angelina Donis from How to Get Away with Murder and be this lawyer to can put a case together of like his intention? And so, this online safety bill will mean that if you just send it, it's an offense. So it, there's, even if it was a mistake, an accident, it doesn't matter. And I think that kind of like reset of culture norms online and dating on social media is important. I'm just not sure about the criminalizing bit. And uh, I think a lot of people are misreading the petition or the call and thinking, okay, women want their own special thing, which I don't think that's a bad thing. But actually this time around, this petition actually helps. If you can make the online space safe for women, it means everyone has the chance to be safe online. No, I agree, definitely. And it's like we said earlier, like where actually at the moment is safe to be a woman? Yeah. And it's one of those things that I, I, you know, I went to the House of Lords briefing and I said, unless we put this code of practice in, there will get to a point, there is a point where I no longer feel safe in my own home. So uh, genuinely, where do women feel safe if it's not on the internet and not in their own home? I, um, I talk about the impact of online abuse in the book. And I think a lot of people forget that you are on your phone or, you know, web WhatsApp now people use or, you know, the the, the website versions of social media platforms. You are in your home and so you can't leave or you are working from home so you can't leave. So this idea even that you can just leave is, is, is not true. And then it impacts somebody's home. So health and safety and the psychological impact, like where are they to go? You've made their home so unsafe. And then we know that people are stalking online. People are po- are taking, it's why I try and encourage a lot of influencers to stop doing the get ready with me, to stop doing the go, you know, follow me as I go to here. Because people will start painting a picture. People will mm. start waking that out and being like, oh, you live on XYZ. So when I post anything outside my house, it goes to my close friends. It doesn't go on my platform. It doesn't go on my platform. If you want to get ready with me, you're not even going to, you're going to maybe see my steps on the street, but you're not even going to see the, the, the street I'm walking on until I'm at my destination. That's yeah. when the get ready with me will start. Um, and yeah, I'm going off on one, but that I, yeah, I'll stop there. No, I definitely agree. I think actually one of the biggest pieces of advice that I got when I kind of stepped into this industry is something that I told my friends because I don't think it was something I ever crossed my mind until Mm. I became part of this industry Mm. is that I did a TikTok on it and actually blew up about turning off location settings on Instagram so people couldn't use your Instagram to track you. Good. Um, Because there were a lot of criminal gangs saying that they use it to track high high net worth individuals to potentially steal from them. Yeah. Um, And also to not post your live, your actual location when you're at a restaurant when you're there. Um, And it was like, you know, we were told that as influencers, like, so you don't have press hanging around or so you don't have like fans that are like crazy about you appearing at these things. But it's also like just general well-being and safety general well-being and safety and it's in our workshop tips it's in the book as well about making sure you post when you've left or if you are having to post I know a lot of politicians are posting on the doorstep making sure you're not on your own um the 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 the, 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 the location ones are interesting you just remember it reminded me of a of a story when I was in a when I was in a school and I was hearing how uh, a school, a couple of kids in a school posted that they were going on holiday. They were really excited. They posted on TikTok. They were on holiday and they posted everything about not being at home. Mm. So then their house got burgled. Yeah. And 
it, it, and now home insurance companies are finding a way to say, actually, if you've let it be known that your house is, you know, vulnerable, we're not going to pay out. So this has a knock-on effect. Um, what, when we go back to digital citizenship, it's that what the individual can do. It, it really can save not just your life, but the lives and the well-being of your friends and family. Yeah, we, I mean, we've seen stories in the past of high net worth individuals having their homes broken into because they're trackable, but their families are still in their homes. And yeah. that causes long-term like psychological impact yeah. on them rather than just your belongings. Yeah. So it is really, really important to be aware of what you're posting on social media, not just for the safety of yourself, but for the safety of other people around you as well. But we have spoken and touched a, a lot on your book and um, I do want to talk about it. Uh, why? What inspired you to write the book in the first place? Um, I just couldn't keep up with the amount of conversations people wanted to wanted to have with me about <laughs> online safety. I could I couldn't keep up, so I was like, okay, let me create this workshop. And people still wanted to be able to like troubleshoot certain things and arcs. And a lot of the conversations I was having was convincing women that they were a right to have di- to do digital self care. Like it was, a, I was spending a lot of time convincing people that you know this is not okay. And so when Penguin came and said, would you be interested in writing a book? I was like, yes, because I can now be having a conversation with somebody through the book as if we're going for coffee and you're asking, okay, what can I do? And the, the fact that the publishing industry are seeing that this is a, um, an issue that is affecting a lot of people and where mainstreaming the conversation was also really important. I get told a lot that, you know, online safety is quite a niche subject. I was like, is it? is it really and and we're seeing year on year it is not a niche subject it's growing and growing and um that was important to me too that we shine a light on women who have felt like they had to suffer in silence and the biggest thing that I have loved from people reading the book and giving reviews is that oh I did not realize what I went through was abuse I just I just like suffered through it all and helping people realize that what they had faced was not okay and they were silenced and now that's galvanized them to want to go back and to reclaim their space is like chef's kiss the dream of why I wrote that book it's interesting like when you say people you have to convince people or like educate people on knowing that what they are receiving is abuse like the amount of times I've gone into a school and I've spoken to young teenagers like young female teenagers about image abuse and they don't see it as image abuse because it happens so often yeah and it's get, so normalized isn't it yeah and it's interesting you say that people said online safety is a niche like please show me who is not online like if you walked into a building every single person is online at some point anything that uh relates to women or girls is told as a niche and we just know that's not 50 percent of the population is not niche <laughs> <laughs> it is not niche at all like, if that's a niche then i really don't want to know what you think is not a niche <laughs> like, yeah yeah um no that's I, it's one thing that's really like surprised me but why why do you think that certain demographics are disproportionately targeted online um because violence against women or gender-based violence patriarchy racism white supremacy whatever oppressive system you want to call it doesn't exist in a vacuum. So what happens offline is going to translate online and in technology. If we ha- that, that's why we have things like racism and sexism in the workplace. You know, we had the Me Too movement because racism and sexism doesn't just exist in a vacuum. It, it will spread through Hollywood. It will spread through, you know, government institutions and civil service. You know, we have a whole bullying case being discussed right now by a senior member of government. Like, it doesn't just exist in a vacuum. It's part of a continuum. So the online affects the offline. And it's why I really spent a lot of time at the beginning of the book saying, we have to challenge our language. We have to stop saying the online world is the is the is the fake world or the virtual reality world? I mean, there is virtual reality, but like the real world and the on, and and the online world. Like, no, the online world is very real. It has very much real consequences and and feelings and experiences. Um, and I think that we have to realize that the technology is being used and weaponized to keep upholding these oppressive structures. No, it's and that's a point that I keep making that it does transpire into the real world because, you know, you might have an egg as your Twitter picture or a robot as your Reddit picture, but in reality, that is still somebody's family, like relative, partner, um, colleague. And, you know, they might not display those opinions out loud, 
to you, but subconsciously they still have them. And, you know, even when I talk about gender pay gap and the amount of people that tell me it's not real because mm. I would just hire more women, I was like, mm, there's so many unconscious bias things you are yet to learn. Mm. That's because you are 14. <laughs> but like, there are so many things you are you are let to, yet to learn. And when I pointed that out to certain members of like certain parliamentarians, they were actually really taken back by the fact they were like, yeah, actually, it could be the person that sits next to you on the train that might hate my skin colour or the fact I'm part of the LGBTQ community and like because I'm so open about it hate me and might want to cause harm to me but they'll do it online as opposed to like in real real face but they still hold those biased opinions of you yeah that's why I think it's a shame that the digital citizenship aspects of the online safety bill and the whole education piece has gone because also as part of digital citizenship is educating yourself offline. So it's about decolonizing your education, your experience. It's about, I call myself a recovering dickhead, it's about learning and unlearning and understanding what prejudices you may be holding about certain communities. You're not going to be a good digital citizen if you still hold those bigotry opinions offline. Yeah. And so it is really important and why we work and sign posts to like decolonizing education networks and, and, and folks like that, that we don't want the online space being used to mask uh, the intolerance that is breeding in society. And therefore, through the back door, have far-right groups, have incel groups who are organizing and whipping up people to join these hatred groups. Like, there is a real grooming movement happening. And then you end up really not sure if... Um, I talk about it in the book. I, I interview somebody who found out the person who was sending them the, this, the most disgusting anti-Semitic trolling was in the cha uh, law chamber with them, was a fellow lawyer. Oh, God. And that's a story that will help pe open people's minds to be like, oh, okay, a troll could be one of us. Like, I think we'll get some stats soon around saying, like, one in six people are a troll, one in six people have a fake account. And I know that because some of the research that we didn't release with BT Sport was giving some indications of people having multiple fake accounts. And not your finsters, not your kind of, like you know, um, DOS account so that you can, like, have a personal Storm thing with your friends. Storm blocked you. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, using it for, like, malicious reasons. Um, it also challenges what do we say to ourselves? What's our unconscious bias when we think of a troll? Yeah. We don't think of a troll. When we think of a troll, we don't think of somebody who is in one of the most uh, world-renowned known law firms in the world being a, tro being a troll. Yeah. We think... Probably working class, greasy, overweight, man. Actually, no. And I've written about this. It's in the book. And there are a lot of women, a lot of influencers who are trolls, who are using their platforms to instigate uh, hurting other people. We know of that forum, Tassel or whatever. Like, we have to change our stereotyping of trolls if yeah. we are going to want to address this issue. And that's not just looking at the far right. It's also looking at our near enemies as well on the left in social justice movements. It's why, taking this back again to the what the individual can do when it comes to digital citizenship, it's making sure that we are not perpetuating harm. We are thinking about online etiquette. We are thinking about amplifying good voices and we're doing the learning and the work to be anti-racist and allies allies multi-direction in a multi-directional way online so that we are reclaiming that space we are setting a tone and a leadership and say like this is how our community needs to be in 2023 we've not survived the pandemic to now be troll trolling each other in 2023 like what is that yeah i guess you pretty much answered my next question because i was going to ask you how can you be a better ally mm. so you've pretty much answered that to be honest yeah i think it's really thinking about doing the work and doing the work to like okay, what is my responsibility here? Like, if I've got, you know, I talked to Jamila Jamil in the book, but also I know um, MPs who've said, look, I, I support everything you're doing, but I don't want to retweet you because I don't want the trolls that come for me to come for you. When I support Diane Abbott and she retweets me and she thanks me, the, the thread that I'm a part of for days that is disgusting and violent is un. Is, ridiculous or a man in the in the US when I'm when I'm brought in something with her like it's it's disgusting and we all need to keep our eyes open to this because people are suffering in silence we also need to not amplify it I think there's ways we need to learn skillfully that trolls do want us to amplify their behavior and get get um get the limelight but 
There is so much that we can do and it is real low-hanging fruits. It isn't having to put yourself on the firing line, which I think a lot of people think, oh, if I say something, am I going to get cancelled? Am I going to get trolled? Like, it doesn't have to be in that way. No, that's... um. That's really important to like highlight that you don't have to like, it doesn't have to be a ginormous gesture. It can be something so small and it makes such a massive difference to a lot of people. Um, my final question to you, I always ask people, my guests um, similar questions, but I wanted to ask you why, um, what would you say to people that doubt your life experiences based off the fact that you're a black woman? Oh, Oh my God, I've got somebody lost for words. It very rarely happens here. Is it? <laughs> well, I'm thinking about why I say that I don't get myself in trouble. Because um, <laughs> I would say just fuck off. But um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people have said that, to be fair. <laughs> you know what? It depends. Who am I needing to convince? What do you have that I need to convince you? So do I need to convince you because you're a funder? Or do I need to convince you because you're a politician? Like, what? It depends on who you are because... If you're not someone that can unlock resource and support for our organisation or my work or my safety, you know, there are times when I've gone to police stations that I have to convince police officers what I'm going through is problematic. If it's not that, then I don't really care what you think. I think I've done a lot of work to stop convincing people to listen to me and believe me. I've done a lot of work to, to, um, to build my own inner self-trust around my leadership, around my activism, around the way I run my charity. And, and it's not in an ego way, in a bad ego way. It's in a real healthy ego way. Like for you to say something to me, you have to really have some elevated status in my life for me to really believe that uh, really what you have to say to negate my experience. Um, and I think I have that vim because I started Glitch with lived experience. I started it with centering my survivor story and other survivor story where a lot of people were still wanting to uh, put the focus on quantitative research and what the data was saying and all of that. So unless you are my mum or you're going to unlock millions of pounds for my charity, I'm not going to spend my time convincing you about my lived experience. It's interesting that you made a point about um, ego and you're like, it's not an ego thing. And I think we, we kind of say that in like, as a woman in lots of different situations, it's not an ego thing. Like I'm just like, trying to do well in my career. Whereas with men, they would never be like, oh, it's, an e- it's not an ego thing. They would just be like, I am who I am. This yeah. is, and like, you know, it's, I think it's really amazing to hear that you have done that self-development and that work so you don't feel like you have to justify that but no honestly on on the ego thing that was the I had a sabbatical for three months last year to rest recuperate and just like recalibrate like okay what's next what's the next phase I'd done five years at glitch I wanted to do a a few years more like what what do I want to do so I wanted to make sure I rest and I worked with a sabbatical coach an amazing um, black woman who helped me through the recovery and the rest because I had serious 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 burnout and that's another topic uh, topic to discuss but the thing that was a catalyst in my development was having a healthy relationship with my ego in accepting honor and uh, honor and due for the work that I've done because that's also in my ancestors my ancestors believe in storytelling and paying homage and respect to elders who have who have gone gone, gone before us so why would I suppress that side of me because as you said men don't um, and it's suppressing my body's need. Like if we didn't have an ego, if we, we have an ego for a reason and all the work on the ego around self-trust and real self-belief and agency, like I am good. Like I'm a good human being. I am, I am smashing it at life. Like being able to say that with, with, without the caveat, as you said, like duh, 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 was a big catalyst for my development. It was a big catalyst for stopping overextending to um, having to prove myself, overworking because I felt like I wasn't enough. Like when you can get to that level of self-acceptance with your ego, you are flourishing in life. I think that's uh, an amazing end to the podcast. And I want to say, like, like, honestly, that's so good. I can take that and like carry that with me for the rest of my life. But honestly, I want to say thank you so much for giving up your time oh, and being such an amazing guest.